speech. John? You know, personally, I think uh, the Sea Island transaction, which recently occurred, and also Frederica, and quite frankly, our purchase of Campanile, both what could be considered trophy projects uh, held by large banks, finally said, okay, we're going to cut loose here. And in both cases, it was about a third of their debt load. So now you, ha now you have banker B and C saying, well, if they can do it, we can do it. That's a simple way to look at it, but having been a banker through that 89, 90 debacle, and then I left and started my company, and actually worked out deals for other developers that you're mentioning that actually survived the cycle and, and went on, I learned a great deal about how to play the game during these times. Um, and so I think, I think you'll see the reset button get hit by bankers and start to let it, let some of these assets go. They also, quite candidly, couldn't let them go all at one time because their earnings were already suffering so bad. So, you know, what people use as a term is kick the can. They're trying to preserve earnings is what they're doing from a quarterly basis, Prever preserve their stock and their reserves, et cetera, et cetera. So now they've gotten through some of the pain you know, they can start letting go some of these assets. And I think they'll, they'll meet, to Mike's point, they'll meet the market, uh, and to Jeff's point, at a much more aggressive place than they would have met it had they tried to sell those assets 12, 18 months ago. So I think it was a smart play. I think they learned a lot from the RTC, too. Mm -hmm. I, I think a couple Good distinctions we, we try to compare and contrast back to 92, 93 RTC days and now. A couple differences. One is we're a much more mature industry now than we were in 92, 93. We were kind of the redheaded stepchild back in the early 90s. And as I put it now, we as an industry, we sit at the big table at Thanksgiving dinner and not in the kitchen at the card table anymore. So we're really, what I mean by that is we're part of the true asset allocation model. We are an asset class within the institutional investor world. And we weren't that in 92, 93, so we're much more mature. Two is um, it's a different market right now from who has the keys to the real estate. You know, we have this whole CNBS market that we didn't really exist back in the early 90s to the level it does today. And out of $730 billion of total CNBS, uh, almost $100 billion, about $92 billion in special servicing. It will be $100 billion by December. So that's 11, 12 percent of the market, and that's going to continue to escalate. My guess is that'll... Uh, by this time next year, uh, hit the peak in terms of uh, defaults, maybe 15 to 20 percent ultimately. And then I think a, a really interesting distinction is a lot of the junior and middle management folks at the banks back in the early 90s, uh, if they weren't like John and they left and started their own company, they're still at the banks and they learned a lot from the early 90s. They saw assets that they sold for $20, $30 a foot and they made millionaires out of investors at that moment in time and they're sitting back and saying, why don't we go do that? You know, we're in no rush to go sell and liquidate at 40 $50 a foot. We as a bank, we can go take the keys back. We have no problem with operating the real estate, finding a partner, doing an ABC structure. So the mindset within the banks are much different, uh, that mindset, than what it was in 92, 93, 94. First and foremost, the industry has changed greatly. There's a plethora of capital, probably 40 times as much capital in the marketplace today as there was in 92, 93. So the banks, um, it wasn't, they didn't do it on purpose, to John's point. They just kind of waited, and the market has moved, and the values have gone up, and cap rates have come down appreciably. So we think 2011, we're going to see more transactions from the balance sheet lenders, the big uh, money center banks, as well as the special servicers than what we saw in 2009 and 2010. Jeff Wark, I'd be very interested in the banker's well, perspective on this. You know, I'd, to responding... Um, to Mike, you know, I, I think back to the to the last cycle. Um, I spent most of the 80s and early 90s doing workouts across the country, and we have learned a lot of lessons since those days. There's a difference in in this cycle, in this recession, and that one. And you know, America's had 11 recessions since 29, and they're all different. And this one's unique. Um, what was different about the, the one in the in the early 90s, late 80s, and this one is. Uh, that one was very sp specific to the real estate industry and the SNLs and the, and the banks. And there were other capital sources available outside the industry that helped. And when we were sitting in, I remember sitting in the late 80s and trying to figure out how are we gonna, how are we gonna write, write this ship because there really wasn't any opportunity. And, and sort of the industry finds a way, 
we recapitalized it via the, uh, via the REITs. Um, it raised money uh, via institutional and retail investors and recapitalized the industry. Um, the RTC, as Stephen said, provided a, a clearinghouse that, that moved it quickly and there was capital available that heretofore hadn't been available. So it, it solved the problem faster. Uh, we find ourselves now in a little bit of a different situation uh, in that we have uh, sort of a panacea of economic challenges. And as I said before, the, the solution is going to be outside the industry, which lends you to, to think that it's going to take a while to, to work our way through this. Um, so, I, you know, again, optimistic and hopeful, but a lot of things have to happen. And if you, if you just take the residential uh, market as an example. There's a lot of discussion these days ab about all of that and, and a lot of data points that are out there. Um, but just as, as an example, I mean, price in, in single family housing is very market and neighborhood specific, as you know. Um, but one would believe, and, and some people claim, that you've got to get the title transfer of a lot of these assets, i.e. the foreclosures, to occur before you find the price, before that all that capital that's sitting on the sidelines is, uh, is available to come in. You know, we're sitting in a time where we have mortgage rates, uh, single family mortgage rates, the lowest they've been, you know, in most people's lifetime. Um, but we still have a crisis in, in housing and in, in oversupply. So you have huge availability of capital, but prices aren't moving or assets aren't moving because, because of what we'll talk about in a few minutes, which I believe is the uncertainty that drives all of us uh, and keeps us keeps the investment from happening on a free flowing basis. So I think that that we've got we have challenges through this cycle that we really haven't seen in in quite a while or in some of our lifetimes that are going to take a while to unwind. I would, the, uh, I would like to point out though that I still sit at the kid table at Thanksgiving because they got a lot more imagination. <laughs> and when you're in times like these, you need some laughter. You like to color at dinner, I know. Yeah. You like to color, I know. You didn't grow up in a big family. Yeah. The last thing you want to do is be at the kids' table. Yeah. So, uh, At the last honorary board um, meeting, we discussed what's been labeled here as this bifurcation of capital to trash and, and trophy. And um, I think, Mike, you left early. You, you threw this thing out. The I made my comment, then I left. The, the barbell yeah. effect, yeah. It, it was really funny. I remember when, when I was a student at University of Georgia, um, and uh, I was at a football game, and we were playing Alabama. And uh, at the end of the game, we lost the game, so everybody, including the Bulldog, was very, very upset about this. And Coach Bear Bryant, with his uh, entourage of uh, state troopers, was crossing the field, and a bunch of the cheerleaders with uh, one of the Uggas. In those days, it was probably Ugga Point One. Um, that's how long ago I was there. He, uh, as they were crossing the field, he actually lunged toward Bear Bryant, and one of the troopers kicked him away, and there happened to be another member, looked like a trainer or something, that uh, was wearing the exact same sort of pants that Bear Bryant was. And so Ugga attacked him instead, and everybody just left. The troopers and the, and the coach left, and that poor guy was left, you know, having to deal with this uh, bulldog chewing on his leg. And that's sort of what happened when you left the meeting because <laughs> Rajiv Dewan disagreed with what you said, and he, and he challenged... Poor C.B. Hickson, who was sitting right next to where you were, and C.B. said, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, but it didn't do him any good. You know, he kept chewing on him anyway. So at any rate, I, I'm interested in this, this barbell effect that you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, does it operate in Atlanta? Yeah. What, what are the implications for the properties in the, in the bar part of yeah. the barbell? Yeah. Um, you know, Ugga also attacked another member on this stage at one point in time, but we won't get into that um, on this conversation. <laughs> smart dog, smart dog. Um, you know, I've been saying this now since probably the beginning of 09, and we, it's really been evident this year um, when I kind of talk about the barbell investment market. I kind of use trophy or trauma um, or fortress or fractured. So when you think about a, a barbell with weight on either side of it, there's a lot of capital on either ends of that barbell where the weight exists. So to the core end of the market, an amazing amount of capital that has been formed and is looking to be placed into real estate. And on the other end where there's distress and trauma or fracture, uh, there's a lot of capital. Um, you know, Campanile is a great example. Um, 
Pershing Park Plaza, uh, right on Peachtree Street. Uh, we went to the market with that, got amazing offers and interest. Um, we're about to select the buyer, 7172 cap um, on a deal in Atlanta. So that is probably only 50 basis points off the peak, which would have been probably October 06 for the Atlanta market. So there's a lot of capital on the either side of the end of the barbell. It's where you put your hands. There's not a lot of capital. What I mean by that is the core plus asset, the commodity core asset, a 75, 80% lease building in North Fulton. Instead of having 38 written offers or 30 written offers, we would have five or four or three. And a couple of reasons. One is there's not a lot of capital that's formed that wants to go after that return, which is a, an 11 to 12% um, leveraged yield on an IRR basis, there's a lot of capital kind of that 15 to 20 percent return and a lot of capital at 8 to 10 percent return. So that's one is the capital's not out there to seek that. Two is the product's not out there. It's not distressed enough to come to the market and it's not core, to, core enough to actually have it drawn to the market by capital. And I think the third component is there's not, the debt doesn't exist for that, for that acquisition. The lenders don't like that right now from a lending standpoint. They'd rather go total distress or total core and it's that kind of commodity core. I'm of the belief though what's going to happen in 2011 fundamentally on a national basis is capital gets priced out of the gateway markets on a national basis and what I define as gateway is Midtown New York, inside the Beltway DC, West LA, really Santa Monica, San Francisco CBD and that's about it. I mean quasi Boston Quasi Chicago, maybe Houston, and maybe South Florida are right on the cusp. Atlanta wouldn't fit in that category. As capital gets priced out and gets really frustrated, there's probably thirty dollars to every one thirty dollars of, of capital available for every one dollar of available product. So that dysfunction, that dislocation, it drives pricing. Supply demand econ one oh one. We we tend to spend a lot of time talking about the capital markets, it's actually very easy to understand. It's just supply and demand. That's all it is. That's all it's ever been. It's all it's ever going to be. And so I think capital is going to get priced out of those markets and not only increase the bullseye and expand it to other markets that weren't originally on the list for those investors and to other product types. And then I think the last component was going to happen about April 10th of next year is it's going to start expanding into different, cap different um, sources and product types in terms of the yield spectrum. So they're going to move off core and they're going to go to core plus. So we're going to see in the spring of next year on a national basis, and Atlanta may lag it by five to six months, um, more capital going to that core plus, that 75, 80, 85 percent leased office building, because they just have to get the capital out. And these acquisition officers get paid to do one thing and one thing only, get the capital out. And we're starting to hear things in the market that I heard in spring of 06. I've got to spend the money as opposed to invest the money. And so it's a little difference in the word, but it's a giant difference in attitude. We're starting to hear that now. So I think that's what's going to happen. Barbell market, without question right now, it will exist for uh, the better part of the first uh, half of next year. But I think that's going to start to expand. So where you put your hands on the weights uh, on the barbell, we're going to start seeing more capital, both debt and equity, going to that type of uh, investments. Trophy or trauma? I love that kind of talk. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mike, I, I would agree with you. I think, I think the barbell is, is a good visual analogy. I think it also exists in, in most markets, whether they're equities or, or currencies or, or other ones. And, and I think it's very prevalent in our market because it, it really demonstrates where the capital's flowing. I agree with you completely. I think the capital is going to flow into the into core until, it, until there's no product or until it gets saturated and it's going to move itself around the country. Uh, and our, around the product spectrum, it always does, always has, probably always will. Uh, greed and fear will will uh, will, will drive this economic model. Uh, the distress side, as Stephen said, you're going to see assets coming available, but probably not at, at at prices that everybody wants. So that that part of the barbell is is sort of the more interesting one to me as to how that's going to get flushed out. Uh, but there's a lot of smart money out there that are, that are going to be buying and building core, and when and when those markets get done. Uh, they're going to move the, to the other ones. And, and I guess, as we looked at this morning, Atlanta is, uh, is one of the other ones, and hopefully it's one of the early ones.